Hello, welcome to virtual English class. Same basic idea, slightly different format. If you have not already done so, make sure you log into Office 365 and find your copy of Teams. You should have been invited to a notebook curated by me. If you have not, please email me and I'll see if I can fix that for you. Now, I'm still working on figuring out this whole internet learning thing, so please be patient with me. For example, right now I cannot properly do screen overlays. Sorry. Um, I'll be working on that, but just bear with me. What I'm going to do is I'm going to try and put some screen splices in, so different screens whenever I have a place for you to stop and do something on that notebook. So if you see a question pop up, there it is. Pause and head over to the notebook, type your answer, and then let's keep going. Now, eventually, once I get my act together, I will have learning target and success criteria screens for you. Hasn't happened yet. Again, bear with me. So, your learning target for today is that you will read Act 2, Scenes 3 and 4, and comprehend them. Your success criteria is that you will be able to answer the questions in the notebook and submit them. And because, as I said earlier, it's the same class, just in a slightly different format, your stupid facts of the day are that in 1802, on this date, West Point Academy was founded. It is currently the U.S. Army College. However, it was apparently originally supposed to be the Army College of Engineers. I don't know either. Somehow the rest of them just got added. Whatever. So, moving on. Do now. And for once I can't make you be silent. So frustrating. Um, for the do now, you guys are going to be sort of reviewing what we worked on last week. We know that we're in Act 2. We know that Act 2 is, in a Shakespearean tragedy, going to have to do with the rising action. Everything is building towards that climax. We know what that climax is going to be, even if Caesar doesn't. So what I would like you to do for your do now is figure out, geographically in Rome, where all of the major characters are at the moment and where they are heading. Give me their approximate locations relative to each other. Go ahead and head over to the notebook. Start typing. This should take you about three minutes. All right, so now that you're done with the do now, I mean, everyone is converging on the capital. Everyone in the conspiracy went to meet Caesar in his kitchen, just completely randomly, at 8 in the morning, as planned. They picked up Antony on the way, and they're all headed off towards the Senate. So, the only people left behind, really, are Portia and Calpurnia. Now, because, as you know, Act 2 is the rising action, we all know that in Act 3, sorry Caesar, Caesar's gonna croak with some assistance. So you can kind of see how this is building. As Act 2 ends, we are all sort of being shuffled along in the general direction of the Senate. With that said, go ahead and grab your copy of Caesar and turn to page 815. Right where it says scene 3, we're going to pick up there. All right, so we are in scene 3. I don't know if you can see this. I don't know if I'm pointing at the right place. Am I? Ah. More or less. So, it's scene three. Some guy named Artemidorus is hanging out in the street, reading a paper. If your first thought when I said that was, who's Artemidorus? Yeah, exactly. Some random guy who we haven't met before at all. So, let's see what he knows, this completely random person. So we're on scene three, a street near the capital, close to Brutus's house. Enter Artemidorus, reading a paper. Caesar, beware of Brutus, take heed of Cassius. Come not near Casca, have an eye to Cinna. Trust not Trebonius, mark well Metella Cimber. Decius Brutus loves thee not. Thou hast wronged Caius Ligarius. There is but one mind in all these men, and it is bent against Caesar. If thou beest not immortal, look about you. Security gives way to conspiracy. The mighty gods defend thee. Thy lover, Artemidorus. Here will I stand till Caesar pass along, and as a suitor I will give him this. 
my heart laments that virtue cannot live out of the teeth of emulation. If thou readst this, Caesar, thou mayest live. If not, the fates with traitors do contrive. FYI, if you were curious, live and contrive in Shakespearean England would have rhymed because accents have shifted. You were definitely curious, right? Right. So this Artemidorus guy, whoever he is, has written a note to Caesar. However, in it, he has a pretty solid list of pretty much everyone who is in that group that's about to kill Caesar. And yet we've never seen this guy before. This begs a couple of questions. Namely, how does he know? And if he knows, who else knows? Interesting. Head back to that notebook. Number two asks you about Artemidorus's message itself and how he plans to get it to Caesar. Is he going to, I don't know, mail it to him? Homing pigeon? Bribe a Senate page? What is he going to do? And then question number three is asking about the implications of the fact that we've never seen this guy before and yet he somehow seems to know an awful lot about this super secret plan. This says something. What? Give me some of the implications. You should be taking probably, let's say about two minutes. I'd like a solid answer, at least on the second one. Things are starting to get sort of crowded out in the street. We have all of the conspirators, we have Caesar himself, we have Artemidorus, and now, because there weren't enough people, Portia and Lucius are gonna show up. Remember, Portia extracted a promise from Brutus. Normally, Brutus is really good about keeping his promises. That's the entire reason he was so essential to the plot, right? Dignitas. And yet, he sort of ducked out on her. She's worried, she's anxious, and her husband is not acting like himself. However, she's prone to being a little bit dramatic, we know that. And she is letting her stress get the better of her, and poor Lucius has to deal with it. So, let's keep going. We're back on page 815 for scene 4. Scene 4, another part of the street. Enter Portia and Lucius. Portia says, I prithee boy, run to the Senate house. Stay not to answer me, but get thee gone. Why dost thou stay? And Lucius says, um, to, to know my errand, madam. Oh, I would have had thee there and here again, ere I can tell thee what thou shouldst do there. Portia is being slightly irrational. Go ahead and keep reading until Lucius finally just gives up and leaves. So you can sort of imagine how difficult a position Lucius is in right now. Portia is his boss's wife. He can't just tell her that she's acting slightly insane. But on the other hand, she's given him no instructions. Go to the Senate. And do what? I don't know, just go to the Senate. That's not clear. So he takes off, and she then runs into the soothsayer, because again, everyone in Rome is going to materialize on this street to meet Caesar. Go ahead and finish this by yourself. After Lucius goes off to check on Brutus, presumably, Portia runs into the soothsayer. Yes, the soothsayer from the beginning of the play. He's back. Portia starts asking him a whole bunch of questions. Now, over the course of this conversation, it becomes pretty apparent that Portia has no earthly idea what her husband is up to this morning. Yet, an awful lot of her questions have to do with Caesar. Looking at line 24, Portia even asks, is Caesar gone yet to the capital? Then, on line 31, she asks if the soothsayer knows if any harm is intended towards Caesar. We know that Portia doesn't know. Brutus did not stay to tell her, so why is she so worried about Caesar? Remember that in addition to being one of the noble Romans that Caesar was not particularly friendly towards, Portia's own father committed suicide as a result of Caesar's rise to power. 
She has no particular reason to care about him. So why is she so interested in his whereabouts and welfare? In addition, let's think about why the soothsayer is still here. Caesar made it very, very clear that he was not particularly interested in hearing what the soothsayer had to say. He was also rather rude about it. And yet, here the soothsayer is again, and he wants another shot at warning Caesar. Why? That wraps up Act 2. Make sure that you finish the rest of your questions by Friday. I have set that as the first due date. Normally I won't give you quite this much time, but for this first due date, since I'm still learning the technology as are you, a little bit more time. However, this particular website will not allow you to turn in assignments late, so make sure that you do actually get them in by Friday. Expect to hear from me about Act 3 in your next assignment before the end of the week. However, I'm going to try and make the video a little bit more polished since this one was a bit rough around the edges. I apologize for all the crazy jump cuts. I will post this video on my Sway site. Likewise, I will add a few resources associated with Julius Caesar. One of these is a copy of the digital edition of the Folger Shakespeare version of Julius Caesar. It is, I believe, the same. Obviously, the page numbers are different because it's a standalone edition as opposed to from a textbook, which is the one that most of you have. I will also leave a link to the Spark Notes semi-translated section of Julius Caesar. Obviously, you can't use this for your homework. Yes, I know what it looks like. But if you are stuck, and you are completely at sea, it can be a great resource. I hope you and your family are all staying safe and healthy. Remember that social distancing. I know it's tempting to treat this like a vacation, but safety first. Stay home, send more texts, don't be face to face. And hopefully I will see you all in person very soon. Until then, we'll keep up the digital stuff. Have a great week and enjoy your Shakespeare.